Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video, we have my Game Week 22 preview. As always, I'm answering your questions that you've asked me over on Twitter, such as, is it still worth bringing in Brighton assets? Should we sell KDB for Bruno and then go back again? Who should we triple captain? And much, much more. If you're enjoying the content here on this channel, please do remember to like, comment and subscribe. Without further ado, let's jump into today's video. So here's a player that I did not think I would be discussing at any point this season, and that is Casemiro. But in recent weeks, and really across the season as well, he has really positively contributed towards Manchester United's attack. And I've seen lots of people talk about the fact that he is the most influential signing in the Premier League this season. I'd love for you to let me know down below in the comments, who do you think has had the biggest and most positive influence on their team as a signing in the Premier League this season? I'm not talking about the best player, because the best player has probably been Haaland, but who has had the most positive impact on their team's performances? Casemiro is definitely up there. I'm a very biased Manchester United fan, so I'm not going to comment. I think Eriksen could arguably even be even more, maybe even Varane as well. But let's say that Casemiro has been one of the best. But like I said, everyone knows how good he is defensively, but he's actually been positively contributing to the attack, not only in the build-up play, but also chipping in with some attacking returns. So as always, I thought I would present the stats and see, is this just a knee-jerk response, into his, um, knee -jerk response to his brace recently in the domestic cup? Or is he a genuine FPO option at 4.9 million, which is obviously a really cheap way into the Manchester United attack. Rather than spending almost 10 million on Bruno, if you can get for half the price Casemiro, maybe he's a decent option. Fixtures wise, outside of the blank game week in 25, which looks like Manchester United will now get, and possibly a blank game week in 28, Manchester United's fixtures are really nice. Crystal Palace and Leeds obviously is a brilliant double game week, followed by Leeds again, then Leicester. The blank in 25, which isn't 100% confirmed, but looks very likely, will be confirmed before the game week 22 deadline. Liverpool away, which at the moment looks like it could be a green fixture. FPL still have that as a red fixture. I've changed it to grey at the very least. You could even argue to change that to, to green this season. Southampton at home. But like I said, they also look like they could blank in game week 28 as well. We won't know that before the game at 22 deadline. But with Manchester United, it feels like a very short-term transfer in to bring in someone like Casemiro because a lot of us have Newcastle assets already, maybe a few from Brentford and Brighton, maybe already two from Manchester United. Unless you're planning on using your free hit in game at 25, bringing in another one is a slight risk, especially when it's one that maybe has slightly lower upside. Someone like a Bruno, as we'll discuss a bit later, that has such potential for upside, especially if he is still on penalties, that maybe it's worth doing anyway. But Casemiro most weeks will probably sit on your bench. Is it worth transferring in a bench player that is going to cause you issues in 25, maybe in 28, just for game week 22? Potentially not. But let's look at the stats. So what I've got is I've, I've got his data from across the season on the left. And then on the right, closest to me, I've got his data post World Cup. So this is from game week 17 onwards to give you a bit of an idea about has there been a recent uptick in his performance? shockingly and surprisingly, because I haven't really looked at his data at all this season. He's actually got really good data across the season, but there has also been an improvement post World Cup as well. So minutes wise, he obviously had a few sub appearances earlier on in the season. So we can ignore that largely. He is a 90 minute man. I would expect him to start every game that he's available and play close to 90 minutes in those games. His expected FPL points have increased slightly post World Cup, but this is where we start to get into the nitty gritty of it. His expected goal involvement before, well, across the season, including post World Cup as well, but across the entire season, is at 0 0.36 non penalty expected goal involvement, which for 4.9 million and for a defensive midfielder, which he essentially is, is really, really good data. That's not far off Saka. Saka's non penalty expected goal involvement this season is around 0 0.43. So Casemiro is picking up some really good data. That's better than Andreas. So at that price point, I absolutely love him as an option. Post-World Cup, it's got even better. So post-World Cup, he's at 0.54 non-penalty expected goal involvement. There's been an uptick in his goal threat, and there's been an uptick in his expected assist, so his creativity too. Touches in the box has doubled from 1 to 2. Shots in the box has almost doubled from 0.62 to 1 as well. And when you look at his touch map, which is just to the side of me, you can actually see that, yes, he is a defensive midfielder, and he spends most of his time probably in our own half, but he does also play at points almost like a box-to-box -box midfielder. He does make late runs into the box, as you can see, by getting two touches in the box per 90. And he does get opportunities to score goals and to assist as well. So I do really like Casemiro at 4.9 million. In any other situation, I would look at a 0.54 non-penalty expected goal involvement. I'd look at some of the other data, the double game week coming up, playing for a really good attack and looking good as well, passing the eye test. And I would look at Casemiro and say, yeah, it's worth taking a punt. My issue is that blank 25 is coming up. And I know a lot of people are, hate the fact that I keep on going on about it, but it is coming up, right? And Manchester United look like it will be blanking. Game week 28 is a blank in which Manchester United look like they could blank as well. 
It blocks a third Manchester United spot just in case Bruno does continue to perform well or you do want to double up on the defence. That's always an issue blocking that spot. And it's booking in a transfer. Unless you are dead cert playing the free hit in 25 or unless you've only already got one or two assets from the likes of Newcastle, Man United, Brighton and Brentford and game week 25 doesn't look like an issue. You are bringing in Casemiro and then you're going to have to take him back out again in game week 24. And you might well end up benching him in 23 and 24 anyway assuming the rest of your squad is quite good and maybe you're bringing him in as your eighth attacker. So is it worth it for one week when the data's good but not great and he is at the end of the day as a defensive midfielder? Maybe not, maybe not, but I do like the data. This is just to say, I suppose, that Casemiro is picking up much better data than I thought. He's getting in better positions than I thought, getting more touches in the box than I thought as well. He is a decent option in and of his own right. It's just the way that that sets your team up for the future. And I feel like by bringing in Casemiro this week, you're basically booking in two transfers. The transfer to bring him in and the transfer to take him out either in game week 24 or in game week 25. So for that reason, I would probably avoid, but let me know down below if you are considering Casemiro yourself. So we just spoke about Casemiro and started to discuss Bruno Fernandes as well. Bruno Fernandes is, without a doubt, in my opinion, the third best Manchester United asset to own at the moment. Rashford and Shaw, I do still believe, are the best two. And a lot of people are looking at that triple up just because Crystal Palace leads leads Leicester across the next three. You get four fixtures. They're all really good fixtures as well. Three of the four being at home. It looks like a really nice transfer to make. Like I said, we still have the issue of game at 25. And the other issue we have is that a lot of people to get Bruno have to sell De Bruyne. So one of the most asked questions over on Twitter this week was, is it worth selling KDB to bring in Bruno Fernandes? Now, I don't think that's a straightforward question to ask. I think it largely depends on the rest of your team. It depends on if you own someone such as a Salah or Kane instead. Because for me, because De Bruyne has the double in 23, and because he's got such a nice blank fixture in game at 25, I personally think that I would sell both Salah, Salah in particular, but also potentially Kane ahead of Bruno. So in my team, I have De Bruyne, Kane, and Haaland. And personally, I'm looking at probably selling Kane ahead of De Bruyne if I am to bring in Bruno Fernandes. But like I said, you've got the same issue here, that if you do bring in Bruno and you're looking at keeping him, that causes an issue for you in game week 25 and then potentially game week 28 as well. If you, if you can even get through 25, maybe you're planning on playing your free hit. Again, I don't know about blank game week 28 at this point, but we will know in the next few weeks. So that could potentially cause an issue there. But let's say actually that you are just going to do De Bruyne to Bruno, you're probably or almost definitely going to want to then bring De Bruyne back in for game week 23 because Man City have to double in 23. So the question comes, is it worth doing KDB to Bruno in 22 and then Bruno back to KDB for 23? So what you're getting is you're getting Crystal Palace and Leeds and then Aston Villa and Arsenal in two weeks, but it's going to require two transfers. Let's say that both of them are for free. I don't think that should necessarily change the way that you view this. It is still two tr transfers. And as I've said on multiple occasions on my channel, I try to still view transfers as being worth four points. They don't always cost you four points, but I view transfer as being worth four points. So are you going to get, by making this transfer of, of Bruno, then back to KDB, going to get an extra eight points? So basically, the way that I would try and look at this, and it's not an exact science, you can look at it other ways. Do you think Bruno will score eight more, at least eight more points than De Bruyne in game week 22? The answer for me is I'm not really sure at this point, because... As we're going to discuss in a second, De Bruyne's stats are absolutely brilliant, better than Bruno's, and Tottenham have not been defending great. And this is the sort of game where you could imagine De Bruyne popping up. Of course, we have seen this season that De Bruyne was dropped against Spurs previously, so it could be that De Bruyne doesn't even play this, but I would expect him to play this fixture, and I would expect City to do relatively well. Although, again, City haven't looked as remarkable as they were earlier on in the season, and generally across the season, they haven't looked that great. So I understand all the reasons you would want to do it, but for me... Whenever it requires two transfers, and I know I'm bringing in a player just for one week, and then I'm going to want to ship them straight back out again, I'm not so sure. But like I said, the stats would also say that maybe selling De Bruyne isn't the best idea anyway. FPL points and expected FPL points significantly higher than Bruno for both. Non-penalty expected goals slightly better. Expected assists quite a bit better there. So De Bruyne's non-penalty expected goal involvement is 0.83, whereas Bruno's is 0.63. But of course, you're going to get basically 180 minutes of Bruno in game week 22. I guess all of this to say, I really want Bruno in 22. And I understand that people are pretty desperate to get him in. Because if he is still on penalties, he's an exceptional option for this double. Both at home, both really nice fixtures as well. Two defences which haven't been terrible, but have definitely not been at the top of the table this season. And then going into Leeds and Leicester as well, you do want to keep him. But even just for that double, he looks really good. But I don't know that I would want to sell De Bruyne to do it. So if your only two premiums are De Bruyne and Haaland... 
I would probably say no to this and I would be looking at trying to find other ways to bring points into my team, whether that be bringing in Yonto up top or Rodrigo, or maybe just looking a little bit longer term and bringing in Erdegaard or Enketia. I think there are other ways to bring points into your team this week without breaking it because you are going to have to transfer Bruno out. If, if not in 23, even if you don't want to go straight back to De Bruyne, you're going to have to do it in game week 25 anyway. So at least across the next couple, this is going to require two transfers to bring, to bring Bruno in. But if you do it for someone like Salah or someone like Kane, you're not losing an extra fixture in 23. So yes, you still have to take him out again in 25, but you don't have to immediately do that in 23. So what you are doing then is you're bringing in Bruno for three game weeks and for four fixtures. And I think when it's a little bit longer term like that, I don't have as much of an issue with it. So I'm still tempted to sell Kane because I don't have to bring Bruno straight back out again and bring Kane straight back in. But I still think you face the same problem, that Kane has better data than Fernandez. so does Salah as well. They are probably better options than Fernandez too. So it is very kind of short-minded. But I'll leave the decision up to you. Let me know down below if you're currently planning on bringing in Bruno. If you're asking, if, would I do De Bruyne to Fernandez and then back to De Bruyne? My answer is probably no for that, and I would look at other ways to get points in your team, especially if it's for a hit either week or both weeks. I would probably avoid myself. So there were some further questions around Brighton assets as well. I've discussed Brighton a lot in recent weeks. I've looked at the stats. I've looked at the players that I like. So if you want to see my opinion on Matoma versus March, which was another question which was asked a lot, my most recent video before this one, Game Week 22 transfer targets, I talked about Solly March and Matoma. The short of it is that I prefer Matoma. But if you want a more in-depth discussion, go back and watch that video there. This video is more about kind of more macro thinking. Is it too late to bring in Brighton assets? Is it still worth bringing them in with the potential blank game weeks coming up and a bit of a discussion in around that? So Brighton have exactly the same situation as Manchester United. Now, it does require Newcastle to not lose by more than one goal in the second leg of the EFL Cup semi-final. So let's assume that Newcastle do progress and they beat, uh, and they beat Southampton and they get through to the final. Brighton will blank in game at 25. I did say there's a small opportunity for them to get a fixture rearranged in game at 25. That is now not possible because they've progressed in the FA Cup by beating Liverpool. So if Newcastle get to the final, Brighton will blank in game at 25. But like I said, there's also a reasonable chance that Brighton blank in game at 28 as well if one of Manchester United or Brighton progress further in the FA Cup once again because I believe it's the FA Cup quarterfinal round in that midweek there or in that weekend. So basically game at 28 could also be a blank for Brighton. So if that's the case... At the moment, Brighton have no upcoming doubles and they've got potentially two blanks in the, ne in the next seven fixtures. The fixtures in and around that are absolutely brilliant. The Brighton assets are still fantastic value. And I, I do still really want to bring the Brighton assets in because they're performing so well. My issue is it just ruins your team going forward and you're just causing yourself more problems moving forward as well. And again, it comes, up to, it comes back to that debate of how you want to play FPL. Are you just looking short-term, having fun, and you'll deal with the blanks as and when they come? If that's the case, go for it because the next three are Bournemouth, Palace, and Fulham. Bournemouth and Fulham both being at home. In the next three weeks, Matoma could score four or five goals and all of a sudden it doesn't really matter if you have to take a hit to remove him. So I understand all the reasons you would want them. I think for me, I've tried to boil it down to sort of three examples where I would be happy buying Brighton assets and outside of that, I would probably avoid. So I would be happier buying Brighton assets if you think you're going to free hit in game week 25 and, uh, sorry, and or, or game week 28. If you've got a lineup and you're thinking, Game week 25, almost definitely on a play my free hit. Then go for it because then you get Bournemouth, Palace, Fulham. You free hit them out and then you get West Ham leads. And 28 at the moment, we don't know if that's going to be a blank week for Brighton. So looking at that there, I think there's a there's absolutely justification if you're going to free hit in 25 or maybe 28 to bring them in because you deal with one of those two blanks there. The other reason is maybe you're already set up in a really nice way for game week 25. Maybe you've only got Trippier and Rashford maybe as the two from Newcastle Man United, and you don't own any Brentford or Brighton players outside of that, and maybe you've got a really decent looking squad for 25, bringing in another player that blanks in 25 maybe doesn't cause an issue for you. So maybe your team's actually really set up nicely for 25. If that's the case, then once again, I wouldn't have an issue bringing in one of Matoma, March, Esther Pinyan, one of those really nice options from Brighton. And then the other reason is sort of what I've alluded to earlier, which is you just think that Brighton assets are that good that they will outscore the alternatives by sort of four to eight points. The reason I say four to eight is, again, you're using a transfer to bring in, let's say, Matoma in game at 22. You'll probably have to sell Matoma in game at 25 or in game at 28. So it's two transfers to bring them in and to take them out in the space of a few weeks. Like I said, if you think Matoma would outscore an Erdegaard, a Martinelli, an alternative option that doesn't blank in 25 over the next three or four weeks then go for it because taking that hit, if Matoma's outscored him by 12 to 15 points, then it's only going to take knock four points off of that. So you're still going to have gained points on those around you. When the likes of myself, 
I'm probably going to end up avoiding Brighton assets because my team's already in a slightly precarious position for 25 and I'm trying to look a little bit longer term. So that's my opinion on it. Basically, unless it's one of those reasons there, mainly that you'd be free hitting in 25, your team's already looking good for 25, or you just think that Brighton are going to go absolutely ballistic over the next few weeks, I probably would have avoid bright buying Brighton assets. And I would look to try and buy assets that are still performing very well, still putting up good data, and that have just more fixtures over the coming weeks. Like I said, the likes of an Erdegaard or a Nyonto who has a double in 22, plays in 25. I think these are the sort of players that, in my opinion, are probably better to buy at the moment. Let me know down below if you think I'm just fixating too much on future blanks and thinking too long term and you're just going to bring in the Brighton assets and hope that they do really well. Of course, if you already own Brighton assets, you're definitely not selling them until game week 25. The next three look really good. I would keep them. It's more for those of us that are looking to buy I think we might have missed the boat slightly, especially with the upcoming blank game weeks. So again, a team that I've discussed a lot in recent weeks, Arsenal. If you want my opinion on sort of all of the Arsenal assets together, go back and watch my most recent video where I discussed the likes of Nketia, Saka and Erdegaard in comparison to Martinelli. But there were a lot of questions around Martinelli and whether now's the time to sell him, whether we should hold on to him, both in relation to the lack of goals and assists in recent weeks, but also obviously the introduction of Trossard and the reintroduction of Smith Rowe. Is it finally time that we say goodbye to Martinelli? I don't think so, personally. I'll explain, obviously, the pros and cons for that. Starting off with the fixtures, they're absolutely exceptional for Arsenal for multiple reasons. Number one, just look at them. Everton, Brentford, City's obviously not great. Villa, Leicester, Bournemouth, Fulham. The fixtures themselves are great. They've got a double game week in 23. But the thing I love about Arsenal is that they play in blank game week 25 with a good fixture against Leicester, and they also cannot blank in game week 28. So the two upcoming blanks that we've got in 25 and 28 for Arsenal... You've got a player. So I think an Arsenal triple up at this, at this stage is non-negotiable. They're the best team in the league. They've got the best fixtures and they've got the most fixtures over coming weeks as well. So Arsenal triple up has to happen in your team if you're trying to optimize and build the best possible team that you can. Obviously, there are, there are other reasons to play FPL, but playing in the best possible fashion, Arsenal triple up is a must. I guess a lot of us will have a defender maybe. And I think a lot, a lot anyway, I don't. We'll have one of sort of Erdegaard and Saka. I do still think that the ideal Arsenal triple up is a defender of some kind, just because their defense is great and there aren't many other good defenders at the moment. So a defender of some kind, whoever you want to be, probably Gabriel is still the best option. Maybe Ramsdale, still think Ben White's fine, etc. So a defender and then probably Erdegaard and Enketia. I would say that's the best triple up. However, if you have Martinelli, is it worth selling him? The stats would suggest that there's not been much of a decrease in his performance post-World Cup. And a lot of people are saying that he's not been performing the same since Zinchenko's been back. And obviously, like, Xhaka pushes him into certain positions. He's play been playing very wide. I will agree that he's shifted slightly wider. But let's look at the stats between, again, across the season and then specifically post-World Cup. His minutes have been identical. So we haven't seen a downturn in his minutes since the, since the post-World Cup. His expected FPL points have dropped ever so slightly. But we are talking minuscule there. And again, a very, very small drop-off in his non-penalty expected goals and his, and his expected assists. So his non-penalty expected goal involvement was 0.62 across the season. And then post-World Cup, we're seeing it at 0.55. So generally, still really good data, both across the season and since the World... And since, sorry, post-World Cup, it has been better since than Saka. So he's, again, across a large sample size or across a smaller sample size... Martinelli does put up better data than Saka. So if you're looking purely at the data, I still prefer Martinelli there. Across the season, it's slightly better than Erdegaard. In recent weeks, Erdegaard has stepped it up. So if you again, if you're looking at a smaller sample size, I probably prefer Erdegaard. Enketia just blows them all out the water. Enketia's data is ridiculously good. But what is really interesting is he's actually increased his touches in the box and shots in the box. So he's gone from 7.41 touches in the box per 90 to 10.4 touches in the box per 90. That is actually the best in the Premier League post-World Cup. So Martinelli is getting really involved in the action. Again, some of those are wide in the box in more crossing positions, but to get 10.49 touch in the box per 90, that is the equivalent to Salah at his prime. So he's getting involved in the action still. And then shots in the box has increased from 1.89 to 2.73. So whilst maybe he's not getting as many big chances and maybe he's not creating as many as big chances, he's still getting involved in the action. So I don't think there has been a downturn in Martinelli's performances. I don't think there has been a downturn in the data anyway, not noticeable. However the minutes might become an issue. So again, Trossard sign in, that is going to reduce his minutes on the pitch at some point, you would imagine. And Smith Rowe being back again, Trossard and Smith Rowe's best position is where Martinelli's playing. We could see Martinelli move inward and Ketia dropped out, but I don't think that will happen. And anyway, soon we've got Jesus coming back too. So 
yes, I do think Martin Lee's expected minutes are probably lower than Erdegaard and Saka. That would be the only reason I'd sell him. But I almost want to wait to see that happen. Because if it doesn't happen, or maybe Smith Rowe and Trossard rotate in the cup games and Martinelli just comes off around sort of the 80 to 80th fifth minute every game, then that doesn't that doesn't cause an issue. So I almost don't want to jump the gun in the expectation that his minutes are reduced if they're not going to be massively. So for now, I see no reason to sell Martinelli. I'm looking at the upcoming fixtures and I'm thinking, yes, I would like to complete the Arsenal triple up and get an Erdegaard or an Inketia. And yes, I do think building the ideal triple up at the moment might not include Martinelli, but I don't know that it's worth a transfer at the moment. The other thing to note is specifically game week 22, Everton have conceded most of their chances from their right flank. So where Seamus Coleman's playing at the moment. I think Martinelli versus Coleman is a very interesting matchup. And I really like the idea of keeping him for this week. Because like I said, Everton, I think they've conceded something like 80 chances from their right flank this season. I think it could be a really nice fixture for Martinelli. Even if he only plays 70 to 75 minutes, I still fancy him to get an attacking return. So if you're asking me, am I selling Martinelli? Definitely not this week, personally. Maybe in 23, only if I have absolutely nothing else to do with my team. But I may just hang on to him until, again, if we start to see a situation where he gets benched in the Premier League or every single game he's coming off between 60 and 70 minutes, maybe. But for now, I'm going to keep Martinelli. If you are also a Martinelli owner, let me know what you plan on doing with him. At the very least, there hasn't been a massive downturn in his data or his form at least when we're looking at these underlying statistics here. I'll make this discussion a little bit shorter because I think a lot of people have used their triple captain. And even if you haven't, I think a lot of people are pretty certain when they are going to play it. But there were still a few questions around, if you've not already used it, is game at 22 with Rashford slash Bruno the week to use it? Would I save it for 23? Or would I ignore these two weeks and save it for hypothetically this, this better double game week in the future? So what I've listed here is, in my opinion, the possible opportunities to, to triple captain. Obviously, Smaller double game weeks, if you've not played FPL before, smaller double game weeks will crop up. For example, we might have a double game at 26. I think there's been discussions around maybe double game at 33 or 35 as well. Sometimes we have one in 36. So there will be smaller doubles that crop up like Manchester United versus Leeds and Palace, especially for teams like Brighton who are going to have loads of fixtures to rearrange. I do think there's a, there's a possibility that we'll see smaller doubles throughout the season. But for the players that you would probably want to captain and want to triple captain, I think these are probably the most notable weeks. You've got 22, obviously, cap triple captain in the likes of Rashford, Bruno. I've seen a few people mention Luke Shaw, but for me, it would be Rashford or Bruno. And then the other notable double is double game 23, when you probably want to captain Haaland or KDB against Villa and Arsenal. So I think those are the notable two coming up. Outside of that, like I said, the three biggest doubles this season are double game 29, double game 34, and double game 37. The issue with these weeks is this is the these are the weeks when we want to play our other chips. So I'm looking at free hit in 29. I'm looking at bench boost in 34. So if you're looking at a similar chip strategy to me, where you're free hitting in 29, bench boosting in 34, that only leaves double game at 37. And again, at the end of the season, we don't know what will be happening with UCL. We don't know what will be happening with teams having less to play for or more to play for. Maybe Haaland's injured. Maybe the fixtures just don't line up in a nice way. So I feel like that's very late to be leaving a triple captain, although it has worked well in previous years. So for me, just due to the fact that I want to play my chips in those game weeks in the future, and due to the fact that the later it goes on in the season, you have injuries cropping up and other potential rotation with European competitions, especially for the likes of Haaland and KDB. I think I, I prefer personally getting it done a little bit earlier rather than waiting for a potentially better double in the future. Again, I don't mind that. It's a bit of delayed gratification. If you want to wait and you want to hold on, potentially you will get more points than those of us that have used it earlier on in the season. But if I still had my triple captain chip, which I don't, I used it in 20, I would be using it in double game at 22 or double game at 23. So for me, Yes, I would be using it in one of the next two weeks. When you ask me which I prefer, I would honestly just use your gut feeling on this because I think it's very, very difficult. Haaland obviously has the best data of any player in the Premier League, and I would prefer to triple captain Haaland wherever possible above any other player. However, the fixtures have lined up in such a way, and Rashford's form, and also Bruno to some extent, has lined up in such a way that this is a really nice double gaming opportunity to triple captain someone slightly different. So, I think two home fixtures, two defences that have been leaking goals this season. Rashford has scored in nine of the last 10 Premier League games at home. I do think that Rashford is, is arguably the most obvious option across the next two weeks. So I think if you're going to use it in 22, I prefer Rashford to Bruno, unless you're really trying to rise up the ranks and you just want to go for a slightly more differential captaincy shout, but you run the risk, of course, that Rashford goes ballistic. So if you purely if you're just chasing rank or chasing the mini league, I don't mind Bruno. If you're playing for optimizing points, I think Rashford's the best option in 22. 
I think that still I would just about favour Haaland ahead of Rashford just because of how good his data is and how good we know he is. I know Rashford at points this season has got double-digit hauls, but we've seen Haaland just pops up with hat-tricks out of nowhere. We've said Haaland's out of form, City aren't performing that well, and he just comes out of a 17-point. The man is ridiculous. So I think when we're looking at ceiling, who has the highest ceiling, for me, it's probably Haaland. But looking at the fixtures, they've both probably got quite low floors as well. I would expect both of them to get 10 plus points as a minimum, although I said that in game week 20 as well, which didn't work out that way. So I guess it's down to you. I would narrow it down myself if I still had the chip to one of Rashford or Haaland. So I would go in 22 or 23. I think it's virtually 50-50. For me, I would just about lean towards just Captain Rashford in 22 triple captain Haaland in 23 just because I think City are a better team I think Haaland's a better FPO asset we know Haaland's on penalties as well and I just think he's got a slightly higher ceiling let me know down below if you still got your triple captain chip are you using it in 22 or 23 if so who are you using on and if not what double game week in the future are you potentially waiting for? So as always, we're just going to finish up with some other questions asked. Again, do remember to follow me over on Twitter to ask those questions every week. Also, make sure to follow me over on Instagram as well. Both the links down in the description. I know we really appreciate the support on both platforms. But there are five other questions which I just can't cover in the same level of detail. Otherwise, the video would be ridiculously long. So I'm just going to quick fire answer them. Best Man City defender to replace Cancelo. I think this is probably Ake, maybe Lewis or you just avoid the City defence altogether. The reason I still like the City defence is they still have the best expected goals conceded this season. So they, going off expected data, they are the best defence even above Arsenal and Newcastle. I also like the fact that they double in 23 and they have a nice fixture in 25 too. So fixtures-wise, data-wise, I still like the City defence. I would probably be looking at Ake, especially with Cancelo looking like, at, at the time of recording, it's not 100% confirmed, Cancelo looking like he's going to buy and on loan. I would be looking at Cancelo to Ake or Cancelo to Lewis, but I think Ake's minutes will be slightly higher. I still don't mind a Kanji, but I think once Stones is back, I don't know how long he's going to be injured for. Once Diaz is fully back as well, I do think that maybe slightly more of a rotation risk of Kanji than Ake, just because Ake is really the only player that can play at left back and he can play at centre back. So I would say Ake for me. Should we keep Reese James now that he's back fit? I'm hoping we're going to get early team news for game week 22 on the on the deadline stream, which is going to be on Friday evening, because Fulham versus Chelsea is the early kickoff or the late kickoff, I guess, on Friday evening. So I'm hoping we're going to get news. For me, I'm going to keep Reese James for now. Absolutely. The thing I would say is I think he's going to be eased in very, very slowly this time, because I think that's two or three times in a row now that Chelsea have rushed back Reese James, and it's ended up that he's just got injured repeatedly with the same thing. So I don't think they'll rush him back. And I think what we'll see as a result is I do think he'll start quite a few games, but we might get some sort of sub 60 minute subs. And that does worry me slightly. So I'm going to keep Reese James for now. I'm going to see how sl slowly he's eased in because I do think he's a nice option for game at 25 if I need him. And it would obviously save me from having to use a transfer. So yes, unless you desperately need a defender in the next couple of weeks, I would probably keep Reese James for now. If like me, you somehow still own him. There was a question around De Gea and Melier as well, the keepers for Manchester United and Leeds. Are they decent options? The answer to both is absolutely yes. If so, which one? I think this largely depends on who your other keeper is because if your other keeper is a non-playing keeper or someone that you don't want to play, for example, if it's Danny Ward, they play against Arsenal in game week 25. You probably don't really want to play Danny Ward. And then if you have De Gea as well, who blanks in 25 or looks like he's going to blank in 25, then you, you probably don't have a great keeper for that week. Whereas Melier could be a slightly better option. So I think look at 25, look at your current keeper situation. I like both of them, but I would, I would probably lean De Gea still, assuming that your keeper situation is fine. If it's not, I still think Melier is a great option. He makes loads of saves and he's always really good for bonus points when Leeds keep a clean sheet. The next question is, would you still transfer in Nketiah with Gabriel Jesus likely back soon? So the latest piece of news we've had is that Gabriel Jesus, the earliest he'll be back, looks like game week 25, but we're probably moving more towards sort of 26, 27, maybe 28. So by game week 27, 28, I would expect Jesus to be back in some form, which means you get from 21 to probably 25 or 26 with Nketiah. With the data that he's putting up, and with the fixtures that Arsenal have, including a double game week, yeah, I would still bring in Enketia. I know it's sort of booking in a second transfer, but when that second transfer is so far away, and when the player that you're bringing in is such a good option for the next few weeks, I still think Enketia is probably going to be worth it. So my answer is yes, it's still worth it, and I'm still heavily considering him for game week 22. And then the final question is, is it too late to bring in Mares maybe instead of KDB? So some people are looking at like KDB to Bruno, and then rather than bringing KDB straight back in, maybe finding a way to get Mares in alongside Bruno as an example. I don't mind this at all. I don't think it's too late to bring in Mares. 
I do still think that KDB's minutes are probably going to be slightly higher than Mares, and I still think the longer term, I prefer KDB as an option. Is KDB worth the extra money over Mares? Probably not worth the four odd million that you're paying. No, probably not. So I don't mind the idea of bringing in KDB instead of Mares. To bring in Mares instead of KDB, I should say. But for me, I still think I prefer KDB. I think ideally the triple up to have is Haaland, KDB and Mares and probably to bin off the City defence because even though they keep clean sheets, they've probably got quite a low ceiling. So if you can somehow get Mares, KDB and Haaland, I like that. I still think I prefer KDB to Mares slightly just because I think the expected minutes are slightly higher. But I do think Mares is probably the most nailed winger at the moment. And I would expect him to probably still start both in the double. It's just whether you get early subs and then after double game at 23, is he going to become an issue then? You never know with players for Pep. So hopefully that's helped. Let me know down below if there are any questions that I've yet to answer and I will do my best to reply to as many of your comments as I can. So guys, there you have it. That is my game week 22 preview. Hopefully it was helpful for you. If it was helpful, can I ask you to just do three things for me? Drop a like on the video. Let's aim for 2,500 likes on this video. Drop some sort of comment down below to feed the algorithm gods and also make sure to subscribe as well. We are on the very long road to 100,000 subscribers, but that is my goal for the end of 2023. So any subscriptions will of course help me towards that. And I do just really appreciate the support. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.